So this is going to be informal and off on the, on the fly, so to speak. Um, uh, I'm a moderator, and uh, it's a great privilege for me to be serving in this role. Uh, Rune Majumbar was supposed to be that moderator, but he has been called away on something else. So I'm a last minute fill-in. Um, I want to start by asking both of you to make some opening remarks, but let me preface it um, with some of my own experiences for two minutes, and that is um, uh, when I first joined the government in January 2009, uh, the price of oil was very low. Uh, we had just going through, had entered into a deep recession, not in the United States, but worldwide, and the price of oil in today's dollars might have been $30 a barrel. So it plunged very low, and then it slowly climbed back. And for the four and a half years I was there, I was often accused of single-handedly making the price of oil go up to $100, $110 a barrel. Um, because, now, of you, because of you, Steve? Because of me. Uh, now, I have to tell you that part of the Office of Secretary of Energy are these dials underneath the desk. And every morning, I set the dials. <laughs> um, but uh, at $100 a barrel, uh, things changed mightily. Then, most recently in the last year and a half or so year, the price plunged. Now, when I was in this $100 barrel time, when the price of oil went up, the stock market went down because it was considered a strain for a uh, high cost of oil, and it affected world politics in a very deep way. And now that the price of oil went to nearly 30 but let's say $40, $45 a barrel, uh, when the price of oil goes down, the stocks go down, the exact opposite. Then when the price of oil went up, the stocks went down. Okay, so because it's now deemed too low, uh, certainly by the oil and gas industry, uh, but also by a number of countries. Um, on this is also set something much larger, longer time scale. Oil and gas prices have always been cyclic, but there's something else coming along that's not really going to be cyclic. And that's the risks we face for uh, carbon uh, pollution and climate change. And uh, the most recent news over the last five years has unfortunately been somewhat bad news. I, I emphasize risks. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. But, um, but the deepening understanding uh, looks like averaged over the world, there will, of course, be some places which can benefit. But averaged over the world, it's either bad very bad or catastrophic. Those are kind of the choices one is landing on in terms of the risks, but we don't know where it's going to happen. So, so there's this long-term issue, many long-term issues. Energy is intimately tied with the world economy as well. It's intimately tied with uh, developing countries getting access to energy, all of these very complicated things. Um, where you want developing countries to have access to energy, but you want it to be clean and you want it to be inexpensive. So with that backdrop, let me ask both of you to just comment briefly uh, at opening remarks. We'll have a little bit of discussion, but I really want to turn it mostly at the last 25 minutes or so to two questions uh, uh, from you. And so you can uh, ask uh, these two great men uh, uh, their views. Now, I have to say, um, I've been a long admirer of both of these fellows, so much so that I have ducked my usual tennis shirt and sneakers and got dressed up just for this occasion. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I thought well, I was getting dressed up for you, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bill, why don't you start and then followed by George. No. Professor Hsu has talked about the variation of price of oil. It has profound effects on many different aspects in your national scene. I have focused mainly on its effect on national security because this is the thing that I work in. The, it's, a, it's a complex issue. One of the things we have noted is that in the period when price was a hundred hundred dollars a barrel or even higher uh, Russia was who was a major oil producer and a natural gas producer Russia was had a booming economy and 
Unfortunately, from my point of view, use that booming economy to do some things which we thought were not in our national security interests. For example, they've, they're pouring substantial resources into completely rebuilding their military system, including a whole new family of nuclear weapons. So this concerns some. They're also u using the money, I thought, to conduct some mischief in the international arena. So high price of oil, aside from its economic impact, for example, in the United States and the United States companies, does have a role in national security. The biggest issue that we saw from the high price of oil in Europe was that we saw an increasing dependence on Russia and therefore concerns that the European countries would lose some of their independence because they would be dependent on Russia for supply, mostly of natural gas, not of oil, and at very, very high prices. So we see many, many aspects. I expect Secretary Schultz to talk about the economic aspects of the high price of oil, but there are national security aspects as well. And that I'm going to pivot over to George. George. What Steve Chu said <clears throat> illustrates both the promise and the problem that we face today as I see it. The promise comes from his sponsorship of ARPA-E. ARPA-E was the promoter of the greatest effort at scientific and engineering advance in energy we've ever had. It was also taking place in other countries too. And it's interesting because when government money is serious about some subject, that tends to attract private money. So in the case of Stanford, I believe, and I know at MIT where I serve as chairman of the advisory committee on their energy initiative, the private money is about three to one to the public money but it wouldn't be there were it not for the public money. And during this period, there has been gigantic progress in solar energy and wind energy, batteries. I saw in the paper this morning that Chevy's new Bolt car will get 238 miles, electric car, 238 miles for a charge. When that happens, <clears throat> the electric car has arrived. All of this has really been spurred by <clears throat> this research. The problem is also illustrated by what Steve said about the varying price of oil. I was Secretary of the Treasury when we had the first Arab oil boycott in 1973. We had sort of predicted it in a report I made to the President, which I might say we had some obvious uh, recommendations. President Eisenhower thought that if we imported more than 20% of the oil we used, we were asking for trouble in national security terms. So we were kind of bumping up against that. So my little group studied that. And we said the problem isn't military problem. The problem is the turmoil in the Middle East and we might lose that oil. And <clears throat> we made a number of recommendations among them that we ought to have an energy department or somebody paying attention to this subject because it's a strategic subject. And some it's a storage reserve and so on. All of these things seem pretty obvious to, to us. The president patted me on the head, said, nice report, it was published. There were congressional hearings, nothing was done. So in 1973, I'm secretary of the treasury, here comes the Arab boycott, more or less what we predicted. And. Then people put the recommendations we made into effect. We didn't create the Department of Energy, but in a sense, I was your predecessor because people would come in to me with these ideas they had that sounded interesting and I started to support them. But when the price of oil went down, all interest in this R&D went away. Then when we had the Iranian revolution, 
the price of oil went back up again, and people started to get interested. The price of oil goes down, goes away. Now, with Steve's intervention, we had the long period of high oil and gas prices. <laughs> and those prices produced RPE in, in a sense. They led people to look for alternatives. And now the price of oil has gone down again. And I think one of our big uh, issues in public policy is to be sure that the funding for energy R&D stays there this time. And we have much better arguments than we've ever had before because we can point to the experience with it. We've had six years or so of really major effort, and we can say, well, look what's happened. This has paid off. So we might as well continue it. And we can have that battle. We had an interesting little exercise here. A few years ago, we brought 12 MIT scientists to Stanford. We had a similar number from Stanford. We talked about game changers. And then we had a return engagement at MIT. And then we took our act to Washington. And I managed to get the then Speaker of the House, John Boehner, to set us up with the Republicans on the House Energy Committee. These are the bad guys, right? So I, well, I took a little delegation. It was a piece of cake to sell them energy R&D. No problem. However, the minute somebody said, hey, we got a good idea, let's have the government sponsor this company, and you lose everybody. So there's a big lesson here. Stick to R&D, keep the government out of loans and anything that has to do with uh, making, let private enterprise do that. And I think you'll get the energy R&D. But this is a big issue for us right now, politically. I think Ernie Moniz, the President Secretary of Energy, is doing everything he can to get this baked in the cake. And I think that's a very good thing. OK, thank you. I want to ask uh, a question, some follow-up questions. But um, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, it's been mentioned about this RPE. So that stands for Advanced Research Projects Agency for Energy. It was modeled after DARPA. Arum Majundar, who should have been leading this discussion, was the first director uh, of RPE. I had met him when I was at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory when I was director. I was very impressed with him. And uh, promoted him uh, to a division director status while I was there. And then when I got to Washington, I worked on him to come to DC. So, and it has uh, had a very good track record for the first uh, term. Uh, we, I hope it remains very strong uh, as an instrument for research and development. And I would agree generally with Secretary Schultz that saying that uh, the main business of government, Department of Energy especially, is to fund research and development that can then be picked up by the private sector. But um, going to these issues of, of what we do uh, in these low oil prices, uh, I want to quote um, Sheikh Yamani. He was a former Saudi oil minister. And he said something to the effect of the Stone Age did not come to an end for lack of stones. And the oil age will not come to an end for lack of oil. Now, I have to say this, that's not why he's the former Saudi oil minister. Uh, the point he was trying to make is when you transition from a stone age to a metal age, you go to better solutions. And after that transition, we don't look around with very sad faces at all the stones on the ground and said, stranded assets. <laughs> OK, so what about oil and gas? Uh, people will look. Uh, with very sad faces, stranded assets, if we don't find better solutions, which means economically better solutions as well. Even if you fold in the cost of carbon, the social cost of carbon, let's say make a number, $80 a ton, oil and gas still will be the low cost thing for a lot of things like long distance transportation. We, we don't have solutions yet. And by the way, that's why you students at Stanford have to come up with these solutions. But let's, let's go back to that. Oil and gas exploration recovery is getting better and better. It too is 
technology getting more advanced. And it's able to bring out of the ground oil and natural gas at lower and lower costs. And even though our, finite, our resources are finite, they're better at finding it, better at extracting it. Renewable energy is coming down by a lot. Uh, electricity, uh, natural gas is cheapest, followed by wind and then solar. And so, uh, but that's only true at 10 or 20 percent natural w wind and solar. And uh, when you go to 50, 60 percent renewables, then the cost of the standby, the cost of the trans uh, energy stores, the standby energy on demand sources, and, and battery uh, peak load shifting and day night shifting is also part of the cost of renewables. So, so the good news is renewables is getting very inexpensive, but it has to can still continue to, to race along for the next couple of decades. And so if, let me turn to both of you and ask uh, first you, George, and then Bill, what, what should the United States do in order to keep this intensity going so, as you say, baked into the system? to get up those innovations so we get lower cost alternatives for clean energy and to really make sure we keep our eye on this ball over the next 50 years, 80 years, where we will really have to make a transition. So let me start with Secretary Schultz and then followed by Secretary I Perry. I think to a certain extent it's about politics. So let me give another example. In the mid-1980s, there were a lot of very good scientists who thought the ozone layer was depleting. There were some perfectly respectable people who doubted it. They all agreed, however, that if it happened, it would be a catastrophe. So that I became involved in that. We had a very interesting EPA director and a group in the State Department. I was Secretary of State at the time who took this up. And I talked about it with President Reagan at length. And he decided that we should try to do something about it. So we did something that nobody ever does today in politics. He put his arm around the people who disagreed. And he said, we respect you. But you do agree that if it happens, it's a catastrophe. So what if we take out an insurance policy? An insurance policy is a good concept. You take out an insurance policy in your house, not because you expect it to burn down, but just in case. So that was sold. It didn't get the doubters to come with us, but it got them off our, our back. And just as the RPE has helped to stimulate things privately, when it became clear that the government was going to do something about this, it generated the creative juices in the private sector. And the DuPont company came up with something that you could do that would change the situation. Not what you aspire to by 2050, but what you do today. So we got that getting done all around. And it wound up with something called the Montreal Protocol. And it worked. In retrospect, I think there would be general agreement that the scientists who were worried were right. And the Montreal Protocol came along just in time. Now, what's the lesson? The lesson is to work with people. Try to get a common approach to problems. Our politics has gone off the rails now. If somebody doesn't agree with you, you try to vilify them eliminate them, make call them dumb, and so on. So you just fight forever. Nothing ever gets settled. So I think we've got to get back to the politics of finding common ground. And that common ground ought easily to be, among other things, continued support. The amount of support from the, out of the federal budget for energy R&D, you can lose it in the rounding area. It's not that big. But it makes a huge difference. And if this R&D effort can continue, 
as it has in the last five years for another five or 10 years, the energy picture will be revolutionized. I have no doubt about it. Storage, batteries are becoming more important, better. I mean, how, how can you have an electric car go 238 miles? That's a big deal. That takes the range anxiety out of the picture. So that can, that'll have a big impact. I might say I also learned from the very experiences I had that when you're approaching energy policy, you've got to keep in your mind always three things. Effects on the economy, because energy is vital to the economy. Second, impact on national security, as Bill said. And third, effects on the environment. All three are in play all the time, and you have to work at them constantly. Now, let me give you an example of something that is good for the environment, good for the economy, and good for defense security. I think, and Steve would know better than I about this, but my impression is that we are increasingly able to store electricity at scale. Batteries small scale, but batteries are getting able to handle larger and larger amounts. Think of what that means. It means you take the intermittency problem away from solar and wind energy, because you can go into a battery and then be dispersed as you need it. It means that everything is going to be cheaper, so it's good for the economy. And from a defense standpoint, just as an example, our grid is very vulnerable to cyber attack. It can get knocked out. But if you have some large-scale storage, you can knock out the grid, but you keep going until you get things restored. So it has a major security element. No doubt, if you're on a ship, you're in an aircraft carrier, if you have large-scale storage of energy that's inexpensive, that's a big deal. So there are all kinds of things where there's a positive interaction, but you've got to keep the three things in mind all the time. Bill, thank you. Bill? All of the R&D programs that make a big difference in the energy field are by, almost by definition, long-term programs, for five, ten years. People who are working here at Stanford are working on long-term programs like that. The people who are supporting those programs at DARPA and at ARPA-E understand that, and they have conceived long-term programs, and they fund long-term programs. So that's the good news. The bad news is, is the funding to do this isn't allocated long-term. It's allocated a year at a time. And you, the people in RPE and DARPA plan for five years. They have five, ten-year programs, but the funding trickles in a year at a time as, as appropriated by the Congress. And Thank you. So there's a disconnect between the need for long-term programs and the funding, ability to get funding for long-term programs. The, no matter how diligent and no matter how visionary DARPA is, no matter how visionary RPE is, or the Secretary of Energy, the Secretary of Defense is, they have to get their appropriations year by year through the Congress. Uh, Congress isn't n noted for its long-term thinking. And noted for its thinking. Pardon? <laughs> uh -huh. So how do you deal with that disconnect? And there, ha there has to be some leadership from the top. Uh, I have a question for you. Sure. When you as Secretary of Defense say, we need a new aircraft carrier, it, how long does it take to build an aircraft carrier? If, ten years, if you're lucky. Okay. <laughs> so they have to get, you've got to get a ten-year commitment. Why can't we turn energy R&D into an aircraft carrier? Uh, if you've done it with a carrier, you ought to be able to do it with energy. If you could package your R&D programs in such a way that they funded five, six, seven years at a time, that would go a long way to it, the way they do with a, an aircraft carrier. That yeah, would go well, a long way to it. So it's theoretically on. possible. In fact, it's never been done that I'm aware of. But uh, uh, if you cannot do that, then you really count on leadership from the top. 
So it matters a lot when you go to, to vote this November, who you vote for president, who you vote for president, set senator, who you vote for Congress from your district. Uh, the problem is, though, in guiding on that, you won't find much, uh, very illum much illumination in the discussions, in the debates, political debates. If you listen to the presidential political debates, you will not hear much discussion about the importance of R&D and long-term funding. So you have to make some kind of a judgment on that. But uh, what I'm saying is, is the system is set up, the funding system is set up where the cards are stacked against long-term programs. And so you have to find some force to sort of counteract that negative issue. And the force has to come from leadership, from, your, from the president, from the senators, from the congressmen, of course, from the cabinet officers, too. But then the cabinet officers are selected by the president. Although I must say, I don't think they're ever selected on the basis of their dedication to long-term funding. But that's, that's the issue. It's leadership makes a, you, you cannot, there's no substitute for leadership who understands this problem and is willing to go to bat, willing to go to Congress and fight for the R&D and fight for the long-term funding. George, you want to make a quick comment? Well, I want to suggest a long time, I want to suggest an aircraft carrier. <laughs> it's called a revenue neutral carbon tax. You get that into effect. I've been advocating this for quite a while. But then the, even the Wall Street Journal this morning had a long section on and it had maybe the carbon tax is about to arrive. You make it revenue neutral, so the revenues from the tax get passed back to individuals in my thing. So it'll be popular every once in a while you get your carbon dividend. And it also can be deal with the international free rider problem. People often say, gee, if we do something and they don't do anything anywhere else, not going to do much good for the global warming issue. But if you have a carbon tax, you can say, we're going to apply that tax to any import <coughs> that is carrying carbon. And it goes into the pot that gets distributed. And people might in the other country will say, well, how do I get that money? And we say, it's simple, put in a carbon tax yourself. So there's a concept here that maybe has some global implications. And if it gets into effect and you pass the results out to individuals, it'll have some political staying power. So it's a potential aircraft carrier. I think that's a, a perfect solution to the problem we're talking about. But it was a perfect solution three years ago and five years ago and seven years ago also. And for some reason, we seem, can't seem to get it off the ground. So a question I would ask either to George or Steve, is what can we do to, to get some impetus, some political impetus behind getting a carbon tax really in, uh, established? Well, let me... This, let me here's, this is where the R&D that you people are interested in, I assume, comes into play. Because people say, well, if you put a tax on it, what am I going to do? And the R&D produces the answers of what you're going to do. So there's a synergy here. Yeah, I, I would go further and say, in fact, that was uh, it was a beautiful segue into my next points of discussion, because even if the government pays for research and development, uh, you want entrepreneurs or companies, large companies, small companies, startup companies, to pick up those discoveries. Turn them into innovation means that you take a discovery and turn it to something that gets actually out there. And energy in the United States and most of the world is, is um, it's a private enterprise of sorts. Uh, and so what would induce companies to pick something up, which is a nascent technology where you run risks? And so I would say that uh, a carbon tax actually creates market demand. If you, let's say, know that over the period of 20 years, the price of carbon goes from five or ten dollars to, well, I'll use a number that the CEO of ExxonMobil has been banding about, forty, eighty dollars a ton of carbon dioxide. I became convinced when I was secretary that that alone over this 15 or 20 year period would get the interest of industry. It will give them certainty so they could start planning and it would create a market without artificially subsidizing this and that. 
then industry says, oh, this is where we're going. We're going to have to plan ahead. All the need inventions that come out of universities and RPE companies will then have uh, a market. So, so I always thought that having this light touch of an overall guidance would be very much better, and you can get rid of a lot of little regulatory stuff. Now, to answer your question, Bill, what is different? Well, in the last couple of years, Rex Tillerson and ExxonMobil has come out, uh, Total, and in fact, all the European oil companies have come out very much and said, we want price certainty. The carbon trading scheme in Europe that was instituted didn't do the right thing. It was too volatile, and the price went so low that it didn't induce anybody to change anything. It's now about six euros a ton of carbon dioxide. And uh, you won't get people to start making investments unless they know where the price will be 10, 20, 30 years from today. So, so I think that's something that is growing. The same Wall Street Journal page uh, where the articles advocated carbon tax and said it might happen, there was a rebuttal article that said, uh, Congress right now is not in the mood for a carbon tax. But I always thought, and maybe I want you, both of you to respond to this, if you get more and more of the significant companies in the United States, especially the oil and gas companies, to say, this is what we want, then it gets it out of the political realm. We can get Republicans and Democrats to say, you know, and you get rid of a lot of the little cross things and little complicated regulations. And by the way, make it revenue neutral so, so it doesn't go into, because they're at least temporarily, maybe for a long time, there's a mistrust that perhaps the government can't spend the money more wisely than the private sector. So I want you to comment on those things. You know, what, what, what you, I think, I think it's, it's, it's rising, whether it's going to happen this year or five years from now. It's not going to happen this year, but five years from now or ten years from now. And what you mentioned about the border, I had a discussion with the financial people when I was secretary, and I said, we should do this and we can make border adjustments, because once you determine the price of carbon, it becomes easy. And I was met with, oh, the WTO agreements, they wouldn't go for it, and said, we make border tariff adjustments all the time. So maybe you can help with your economic friends to try to convince people that this is really within the realm of possibility. Just so I throw that well, open. I'm part of a little group that's gradually forming itself and trying to raise money. But we expect sometime early next year to make a big pitch for what we're calling the conservative case for a carbon tax. And the conservative case says, you don't like all these regulations and subsidies? Fine. Put a price out there and let the market sort it out. And that's very appealing to a lot of people. And to businesses, too, because they know what the price is. And a lot of them, as you say, are beginning to realize there's going to be a price of carbon. So as we make our investment decisions, we're going to make that assumption in our decisions. And that will lead us to certain kinds of conclusions. So I think the case is strong. And I'll continue to make it, Bill. And, may, and you know, over time, People didn't believe in airplanes for a while, but gradually they came along. So, uh, as I say, this is a this is a um, an aircraft carrier. I think the biggest single factor which could help actually make the carbon tax a reality would be strong and vocal support from the oil and gas industry. So sort of the, you say that's starting to develop. I think that's that's the way to push push to get that to happen. If it happens full scale, I think that will reduce it quite a few of the arguments against the carbon tax. So I, that is an encouraging, that's an encouraging trend, I think. There's another, there's sort of an aircraft carrier possibility here, too, that works in the Defense Department, but doesn't seem to work anywhere else, that when the Defense Department gives contracts to somebody to build an aircraft carrier, they allow that defense contractor to spend a certain percentage of his overhead on R&D. It's called independent R&D. And 
that turns out to be a large amount of money, and almost all of the companies I know of spend nearly all that they're entitled to spend, and it's a long term. They can count on it for a long term to come. So that gives a solid long-term R&D base for one aspect of the industry, namely the defense industry, for doing that. But there's nothing like that as far as I know in any other department in government. Has the Energy Department ever considered anything like that for, the, for their... Uh... Well, we, we, um, the national labs have a budget. And they, they're allowed to tax themselves. And in that tax, it can be anywhere from a couple of percent all the way, I think it's limited to five or six percent. And the laboratory director, with, uh, with consultation with uh, the leadership of the national laboratories, can decide we're going to put something in that we believe could be breakthrough, it's seed money, it could be a big deal. And this so-called LDRD, laboratory-directed research thing, has been some of the best science, I have to say, that's come out of the national labs actually started with LDRD money. And uh, it's something that the labs themselves are able to tax themselves because they think it's so valuable. Uh, I think the idea of, well, in, in the wholesale energy market and things like that, I think it's the margins are razor thin. And, and so I, it's like supermarkets. Uh, supermarkets uh, are not going to pay for R&D. <laughs> they buy food from somebody, they sell it to somebody, and, they're, and, they're, uh, and it's razor thin margins. But I think as you go more into research and development, uh, uh, that's something we should think about. George, you can say something. I want to point out to a different category of persuasive material that is coming up. The climate is changing and getting warmer, I observe. But for something to be really believed, something that hits you yourself is important. So you want to get Lucy Shapiro to come here and talk. She is a biologist. She says, Zika is the tip of the iceberg. As the globe warms, tropical diseases come north. And we're not ready for them. We need to get ready. But when you see the connectivity of a disease that might affect you with what's happening, then you're much more inclined to say, well, what can we do about what's happening? So unfortunately, unfortunate events like this are going to happen. And when things happen that affect individual people, it's not an abstract scientific argument. It's something that you see yourself. And so you want to say, well, we should be doing something about this. Well, and is it does turn out that the World Health Authorities and health authorities in countries, each country and the military in many countries, are some of the most concerned about uh, changing climates because they have to deal with those uh, on a non-political basis of how do you deal with rising stresses and rising potential emergencies like Zika. Zika, by the way. I don't want to alarm you, but you might think, well, okay, if uh, let's say uh, the three of us here might not be concerned about getting Zika virus because we're, you know, not really planning on starting families. Uh, there could be others who are younger who might not, but it, actually those people actually are carriers because most of the time you have very virtually no symptoms. So mosquito will bite you, who, let's say you're not playing, starting a family, they bite someone else. You move around, and you're the carrier. You're the typhoid Mary. So it's very different. So it, 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 it's not just people in childbearing age, people who are thinking of starting families or trying to start families are the ones that are worried. They have to be worried about everyone else who could be a carrier, a silent carrier, because you might have a, virtually no fever, no nothing, and you're traveling around. And you won't, and you don't want to put on mosquito repellent. So that is, so this is the tip of the iceberg. Not to alarm any of you, but uh, uh, let me, um, as promised, throw the floor open to questions from. Unless you fellows want to make any more comments, or I want to throw the floor open to questions, and uh, 
just you know state your name and what uh, what your question is. The question is the audience is allowed to. Ah, I'm supposed to repeat the question. <laughs> I, I remind me of a funny scene in the uh, <laughs> the television show Taxi, uh, but I'm not going to tell you the joke. But anyway, <laughs> yes. Okay, so the question is, what do you see as interagency cooperation between energy, defense, state? Um, many other agencies, Homeland Security, you name it. Um, let me throw it open to both of you. The interagency inter cooperation. So how does state work with energy or with the military in forming the goals we're talking about? For example, uh, making uh, clean energy less and less expensive, uh, more accessible to not only the United States, but the worldwide. Well, certainly well I think of the Montreal Protocol example that I mentioned earlier. The State Department led negotiations, but we have a science group in the department that work very closely with the EPA. And um, so we had their input, and then we had to get support from around the government, and we had a lot of people, some objectors. I had a very skillful guy who was an assistant secretary. His name was John Negroponte. And he later went on to do bigger things, although that was pretty big. But I knew what President Reagan's view was, so if we had an interagency problem, I said, let's refer it to the White House. And I knew the answer would come from the White House. So we got it done. Bill? Well, it goes back to what Bill said. A lot depends on the top. Yeah, we had, um, during the first energy crisis in the late 70s, I was the Undersecretary of Defense at that time for research and engineering. And my colleague John Deutsch was the Undersecretary of Energy. He wanted to promote solar energy. This was back in the late 70s. And solar energy was just a gleam in people's eyes then. He wanted to promote solar energy. So we agreed that the set of whole new field of silos we were building, that we'd build solar arrays to power them. We couldn't justify that from a cost point of view. We could justify it from the point of view that it advanced the technology of solar energy for the greater good of the whole country. Also, the Department of Energy in those days started to invest in synthetic fuels. It could have been done by the Department of Energy, but the Department of Energy had just been created and didn't have much of a budget. So yes, you can do things across across budgets like it if the secretaries are willing to be a little broad-minded about what they're trying to promote. So we could see that the advancing of our energy futures in this country was in the long term was desirable to the Defense Department. So we did those things. Yeah, and in my day, this continued um, uh, with especially with um, EPA, Defense, and State. Um, the, Government, the U.S. government's the biggest consumer of energy by far uh, of the sections is the Defense Department. And uh, their purchasing power actually can create markets and do things that, uh, uh, the, that they were well aware of and wanted to uh, nudge and create market draw. Um, so State uh, worked a lot with uh, then Secretary Clinton in trying to get policies to, uh, to, uh, to help promote uh, energy, uh, access to energy, clean energy, uh, and drive down costs. So, so this actually was continuing and deepening. One of, the, one of the things I should say is that the secretaries and the deputy secretaries, uh, assistant secretaries, all were in favor of this, uh, but they have to show leadership because there is a tendency of each agency uh, as you go further down to want to own it <laughs> and, and go like this. And so that's something that really uh, steady pressure from the top to say you and continue to work example, together. Steve, of how it was important to the Defense Department. During the war in Iraq, we had forward operating bases uh, very far away from sources of supply. 
and they all used electricity. So they were getting the electricity from diesel generators. So you had to transport the diesel fuel to them. Now, whatever the cost of diesel fuel was at the port, by the time you got out that forward operating base, it's almost impossible to measure the cost. Because if you lost one out of three tankers on there, you, had, you lost all that fuel. You had people killed. You lost a truck. So the cost, people, various people tried to estimate the cost of oil at a forward operating base. It was hundreds of dollars a barrel, many hundreds of dollars a barrel back. So it was very important for the defense to have alternative sources of electricity. So the solar arrays, which we were in a modest way supported way back in the 1970s, now become very, very important. So solar arrays being used at the forward operating base or by soldiers out on patrols made a huge difference in the operation then. So the reason then for this trans department, cross department support and funding can be enlightened self interest, really. Every year there comes to Stanford a group of people we call National Security Fellows. Each armed force says one Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard. <clears throat> and we're discussing issues of uh, alternative forms of energy one day, and the guy sitting at the table said, <clears throat> it was a Navy guy, he said, I'm a naval labor, Navy aviator. I've flown lots of missions in Afghanistan. Every pilot knows you can go down. If I go down, he carries it with him, pulls this thing out, and he says, I turn this on, my friends know where I am. The only problem is it only lasts 24 hours. It pulls another device out, it's a little solar panel thing. He says, I use this to recharge. Very simple, life-saving. I'm a Marine. Marines have a thing you put on, it's a big flap in back, it's a solar panel. So you've got a lot of equipment, you don't like to carry excess batteries and so on, you can recharge things with that solar panel. So the military are seeing lots of things that are practical and have an individual impact like that. Okay, other questions? Uh, let's see, uh, let's see, first you, then you. So uh, the question was, as developed countries put in more renewable uh, resources, what do developing countries whose revenue is, is streams are coming uh, from um, traditional sources of energy, what's going to be their economic impact? Is that OK? Um, uh, anyone want to take a, George, you want to take a first stab at that? Well, if you're heavily dependent on oil revenues, as is Saudi Arabia and Russia, it's a problem. As far as I can see in just reading about it, Saudi Arabia is seeing this problem. They're trying to sell some of Saudi Aramco, and they're trying to change their culture and get some university work there and equip their population to do other things. And they make some progress. I used to be in a company called Bechtel. We built a... Um, community there called Jabail. And it's, it's designed to be a kind of an industrial park and do different things. So you have to face up to the fact that if the main thing you're relying on goes away or goes away to a very considerable extent, you better get something else and get going on it. Yeah, I, I would say that um, Venezuela is another good example. Um, a large fraction of the government revenues comes from oil. And it, uh, it's, it, it's going to a very, very hard times, uh, possibly failed nation status. Um, meanwhile, Russia and Saudi Arabia are dipping deeply into cash reserves uh, that they've had. Um, they're nowhere close to balancing any budgets. And so, but it's also, I should say, impacts developed countries as well. The United States produces where the either the second or third largest oil producer in the world. 
uh, even though we still import oil, we are, we, I think we might have passed Russia uh, up until mm -hmm. very recently because of the uh, hydraulic fracturing, horizontal drilling. The uh, uh, logical solution to that problem for the country is to take the times when they have, when oil prices are high, take the time when they have large supplies of oil, and take the revenues from that, the profits from that, and invest it in diversified industries. That's what Saudi Arabia is trying to do right now. There's a huge inertia against doing that, though. Yeah. Russia announced many years ago they were going to do that. It was when oil was $100 a barrel. It was a wonderful plan, but they didn't do it, in fact. And so today, when the oil is down, whatever it is, $30 or $40 a barrel, they're in a bad position. Their economy has suffered substantially in the last two years at lower prices because they did not use the resources to diversify when they had the opportunity. It's, it's even a grand worse, idea, yeah. but countries yeah. have a hard It's even doing. worse than that because um, many developing countries will subsidize the cost of energy, uh, kerosene, gasoline, diesel. And if they subsidize it, it comes out of taxpayer money, and so they can't spend that on other things, you know, health care, education, you name it. And when the price of oil plunged, uh, many, many people, including those in developing countries, said, now's our time to shrink the subsidy. Because when the price was high, they couldn't shrink the subsidy. They'd be unelected immediately. And very few countries had the courage to shrink the subsidy. Uh, and they're trying to do this, but it, it's, it's, it's a tickle issue, right? <clears throat> There's um, a second golden rule in politics, and that is to get reelected. Uh, there's three golden rules. Uh, there's, uh, uh, well, you, okay, and then there's another question over there somewhere. <laughs> oh, maybe we can do a question. There was a question, there was a question, yes, somewhere, yes. Okay, so I'll try to summarize very briefly. R&D in the United States is very important, but it needs to be made accessible to countries around the world so that other countries can have access to this and can benefit from this. And, and so the question is, is how do we do this? And, and if there are sort of national security implications to, to be considered? Well, let me start by saying, you know, there are always national security uh, in energy, but um, it works the other way too. <laughs> An unstable world is uh, also goes to you know if Venezuela becomes a failed nation state, this is a national security problem. So so there are many many uh, instances where it might actually go in the opposite direction. That you want developing countries to be prosperous. You want them to be economically stable, uh, or developed countries to remain stable, uh, because it's it's all part of that. Um, the question about making it available, how do you, how do you transform it? Uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it over to these two, but before I do, a very quick comment. You know, part of the R&D and part of the business incentive is to try to make some profit. Uh, and, but the question is then, how do you also use that to help other countries? And so, uh, first you, Bill, then George, on, on, you want to have incentive, you also want to make the, available to other countries. How do you do this? Yeah, I think from a policy point of view, it's desirable. I don't think there's an inhibition to doing it from a policy point of view. Making it happen is a lot more difficult. Tech, technology transfer is difficult. Hard to make it actually happen. Uh, we have uh, one benefit, though, that comes out of it, to the extent that we are successful, for example, in lowering the cost of solar power, other countries will benefit, benefit from that almost automatically. But the actual tech te technology transfer needs to be promoted with a lot of energy and a lot of vigor. It's not easy to, easy to do, but in, I agree with the, the premise of the question. It's, it's quite desirable to do it. Of course, the greatest promoter is the marketplace. If I'm a company and I'm making 
good money from selling something, and I see there's a market, there are markets all over the world, then I go and do it in those markets. <clears throat> but here's an example close to home. <clears throat> You're standing in for a run Majendar today, you said. The State Department has a program of scientific ambassadors, I guess you'd call them. So Arun is one of those. So he goes to Poland, and his job is to get to know people in the scientific community in Poland and talk with them about their skills and identify who's good and in a way develop the possibility that a Polish scientist might come here and some U.S. scientists might go there and you kind of promote the emergence of more work together in this area. It's a very interesting concept. But then another, we were talking about Russia earlier. Some time ago, a man named Medvedev was president of Russia. And he came here. He came to the Bay Area explicitly because he wanted to find out about Stanford and the Silicon Valley and what goes on. And he came. We had, my wife is chief of protocol for San Francisco and California, so we went to meet him. The governor was Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Arnold had his own airplane, but he didn't realize that when a head of government comes, the airspace is closed. So we're meeting the president of, of Russia, and Arnold is circulating up there. He can't <laughs> land. <laughs> but anyway, we gave a dinner for him in a place in San Francisco, and the Silicon Valley heads of people were all there. The next day, Medvedev went to Twitter, and our then mayor, Gavin Newsom, who is, uh, always likes to put on a kind of informal a look, went with a coat and a tie. Medvedev showed up with an open collar and a pair of jeans. So he was trying to act like he's in Silicon Valley. <laughs> then he came down to Stanford, and we had a meeting with Ann Arvin, who manages research at Stanford, and he was asking all kinds of questions like, where does a Stanford researcher get money? Well, some of it comes from government, NIH grants or wherever. Well, how does that get decided that he gets it? Well, there's a peer review panel. Oh, well, after the peer review, then who decides? You know, he thought, some government top guy would all decide. Well, the peer review decides. Hmm, that's interesting. Learn something. Well, then suppose somebody gets a good idea and it turns out to be commercially worthwhile. How does the person who got the idea participate? Well, it's such a thing as a patent. And there's a certain ownership here. And so there's a way. It was interesting to see him trying to think through the process, uh, thinking of it in terms of Stanford and then trying to get to know people here. He had an interesting, we had an interesting aspect. He gave a talk in Dinkinspiel, big auditorium, and it was, um, the audience was just whoever came, but the place was jammed. And there was a question period. And he got some pretty searching questions, and he didn't get mad or huffy, he answered them. So I admired that. Then his motorcade left from there to go to the airport. So we got our car into the motorcade because on our my wife's chief of protocol duties, but we're back in the motorcade. And the motorcade pulls up to his plane. It's pretty high um, stairs going up to his plane. By the time we got, we were back in the motorcade. By the time we got up to the stairs, he and his wife were already in the plane. Somebody must have told him we were down there because all of a sudden, he and his wife reappeared. They came all the way down the steps, and they thanked us for our hospitality. And then they said, if you come to Moscow, we want to give you a dinner like you gave us. My wife has always got a little extra twist. She, we had given them California caviar and California vodka. She said, I'll come if I get Russian caviar and Russian vodka. So, <laughs> deal. <laughs> <laughs> but it was um, an interesting thing that in coming to the United States, he explicitly came here because he wanted to try to get an understanding of what goes on between researchers at Stanford and Silicon Valley and business and so on.
So um, the Russians are thinking about it, and I think you have to say in history, Bill, the Russians have a very impressive history of creativity in their science and engineering group. Very impressive. Well, I can personally r vouch for Russian caviar and vodka, but maybe I can get Charlotte to introduce me to California caviar. I've never <laughs> but uh, we only have one minute or zero minutes. Uh, but I just want to add a little bit to this. It, right now, um, let's say wind and solar are, and also batteries, but let's say wind and solar, countries are introducing in a novel way. It's novel from 10 years ago, it's called a reverse auction. And that is, uh, let's say Peru or Morocco or Mexico or Abu Dhabi want a solar farm or a wind farm. They will ask developers to say, you come in, there's not gonna be a subsidy, you bid, you'll get a guaranteed market, you will sign a 20 year contract, we'll pay the bill because people need electricity, what do you bid for it? And so uh, in the last three or four years, these bids, for developers to come in and erect a solar farm or wind farm have been going lower and lower. They've dropped by half in solars. It's now four to three cents a kilowatt hour. It used to be by in 2010 or 12, it used to be double that. Uh, wind is now coming in at three cents a kilowatt hour. Now, who are bidding for these things? They're actually consortiums of groups of people. They're not just finance people. For example, Siemens was part of the bid for the wind turbine wind farm in Morocco. And they're a big, uh, innovative wind turbine. So they put together, so it's a partnership of people in developed countries who actually want to go in and they said, we will do this and we'll, we'll, we'll take 6%, 8% profit per year that's good enough for us. And so this way, technology actually gets in, into developed countries in a very natural way. And so I'm a big fan of reverse auctions because uh, you can actually find out what the cost of solar and wind is without subsidy because these countries are not giving them free subsidies, they're not giving them free land, they're not giving them anything. They're just saying, you know, we'll, we'll give you a place, we'll guarantee you you can site a place, we'll charge you for land use, uh, but other than that, we just want to buy your electricity. You, you build it, you operate it, you, we'll buy electricity from you. And so it's, it's really a very, very good way of lowering the costs of energy and also getting the uh, innovations that are coming largely from developed countries into developing countries. The developed countries see a huge market in developing countries. That's where the action is going to be because that's where the revenues are going to be spent. Uh, new infrastructure. I'd like you coming to an end here, so let me give a little personal example. I have a home on the Stanford campus. I've had it for 41 years. About six years ago, I put solar panels on the home. I've long since paid for the cost of the panels by what I've saved on my electricity bill. I drive an electric car around here. The amount of electricity I use in the car is less than what is produced by the solar panels. So I'm driving on sunshine. What's the cost of my fuel? Nothing. What's not to like? <laughs> okay, so we're gonna wrap up. You know, there, I, I, <laughs> on that, thank you very much. <laughs>